If you'll stand for the reading of the word, please. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The scripture is Joel 2, 13 through 14. Joel 2, 13 through 14. If you have it, please say amen. amen. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It says, that is why the Lord says, turn to me now while there is still time. Give me your hearts. Come with fasting, weeping, and mourning. Don't tear your clothing in your grief, but tear your hearts instead. Return to the Lord your God, for he is merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. He is eager to relent and not punish. I'm going to read in the message. It says, change your life not just your clothes. Come back to God, your God, and here's why. God is kind and merciful. He takes a deep breath, puts up with a lot. This most patient God, extravagant in love, always ready to cancel catastrophe. Who knows? Maybe he'll do it now. Maybe he'll turn around and show pity. Maybe when it's all said and done, there'll be blessings full and robust for your God. Father God, I just lift you up right now and I ask you to bless the reading of the word. I thank you, God, for this scripture, Father God. I thank you that you chose this scripture tonight, Father God, and I thank you for what you have placed in me today, Lord God. I move out of the way, God, and I just give you room. I give you permission to do whatever you want to do, Father God. Wreck me in the spirit, Father God, that you can have your way, Father God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, I always think it is interesting when God allows you to feel a little bit of what he feels sometime, especially when he is grieved with his people. When he gave me this word for tonight, I'll be honest, I didn't want to teach it. I did not want to teach it because I know it's not gonna be popular. I know I'm not gonna get an attaboy when I'm done. Nobody's gonna come up and give me a hug and shake my hand and tell me what a great job I did. But obedience is better than sacrifice. Amen? Amen. So I'm gonna deliver the word that God gave me with no apologies. Amen? Amen? Amen. We are living in a time where people are turning to everything but God. When we get in trouble, when we suffer a loss, it's anything and everything but God. But the thing about it is we are quick to question God, about why did you let it happen? You could have intervened and you didn't. But he wants us to understand that things happen to everybody. And it's not about what happens, it's about what you do about what happens. 
Amen? See, God, he observes our reactions to what he allows. And we get, this, we get to sometimes have a painful opportunity to grow and learn where we really are in him. The title of this message is, Who Do You Turn To? I was reading an article online about 9-11. And during 9-11, or I should say after 9-11, there was a massive surge of people returning to church. And notice I said returning to church, not returning to Christ. The article also went on to say that 90% started praying they were more grateful, they exercised more kindness, 44% used religion as a coping mechanism. Now all of this lasted exactly 10 months. And after 10 months, they went back to less prayer, being less grateful, being less thankful, being less kind. Why is that? Why is that? Because they returned to church and they didn't return to Christ. The church is an institution. They returned to an institution. They didn't return to the kingdom. They returned to the institution. And anybody that is institutionalized realizes that you become accustomed to a certain set of rules. And you follow those rules because you're told. Not because they benefit you, but because they benefit the entity that you're a part of. Amen? So when you have an institutionalized mindset, there's no way that Christ can get in that. There's no way. Our church has been dealing with death, a lot of death. And we know that death is a part of life. But when it's you and it's your family, that's really not something that you want to hear. It's not comforting. It's true, but it's not comforting. When we're talking about death, we also recognize that nine Beautiful, valuable people died a few days ago in a helicopter crash. Now, we mention Kobe Bryant a lot, and that's okay. And his daughter. But there were several other people that also perished, that also left gaping holes in families like Kobe Bryant did. But my question to you is this. When you heard about another tragedy, when you heard about somebody dying before you thought they would, what is the first thing you did? What is the first thing you did? Did you mourn with the family? Did you think, how sad that situation is. And that's a natural response. But what did you do after that? Let's be honest, what did you do after that? Did you think, I need to get to the store so I can get some memorabilia by Kobe Bryant because this is gonna be worth some money. And I, I know I'm on somebody's street. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. Yeah. But I know I'm on somebody's street. What should have happened? We should have been looking at our own lives. 
We should have been thinking, you know what? That could have been me. They could have been mine. What is it about my life that I need to change? And as I begin to contemplate about that, I begin to think about the people that I lost and how I ask the same questions that a lot of other people ask. Why now? I didn't ask why me, because God can say, why not you? But I still wanted to know why. And when I did not get the answer to the why, then I understood that I needed to figure out how I'm supposed to respond. Because one thing about God is he will give you another opportunity to learn the lesson that he's trying to get you to learn. When my mom passed suddenly, and my sister passed 10 weeks after that, suddenly, <clears throat> I'll admit I didn't know how to handle that. You know, we, we talk about all the time, we say a lot of Christianese, uh, God is good, and he is, and he still is. He still is. But, you know, we say a lot of things like we're on autopilot when we're talking about the grace of God, when we're talking about losing a loved one. Sometimes we respond on autopilot and we say what sounds good. I don't know why God allowed that, but I'm trusting him. And on the inside, on the inside, you feel like hell. But on the outside, you look like you got it going on. Like you're the best Christian in the world. Like you know all the scriptures. And that's not the truth. When my mom and my sister died so close together, I had the opportunity. And at the time, I didn't look at it as an opportunity but I had the opportunity to find out did I really believe what I had been quoting, what I had said I'd been living, what I said I had been stating, how I had been encouraging other people. I had the opportunity to see if I really believed what I said. I had the opportunity. And I failed. I failed. When I would encourage people, I'd have all the scriptures. And I would be sincere. Now, some people might call that being religious. Some people might call that being religious. And sometimes you can teeter right on the verge of being too religious if the only answer you have is a scripture when you can't relate to people without the bible when you can't relate to someone without quoting a scripture i'd say you're probably being religious and that was me until it happened to me until it happened to me and then i found out what it is and who it was that I really turned to, who it was and what it was that I really relied on. And it wasn't the word of God immediately. It wasn't people, because we all know when you lose somebody, everybody's around. You have all this encouragement, you have phone calls, people come by. But afterwards, the calls slow down, the visits, become less and less. Sometimes when people don't know what to say any longer, sometimes you just get avoided. Do y'all know what I'm talking about? And what do you do then? Who do you turn to then? If God is really who he, you said he was to you, then he's been there all along doing this knocking 
waiting for you to open the door like he has with some of us right now. This message is not a jump and shout message. This message today is to remind people that God is tired. He's tired of us turning to everything else but him. And then we want to question him when things don't turn out like we think that they should. He's tired of that. God is grieved because we continue, we continue, we continue to turn to everything else but him. There's something wrong when you can quote a stat but you can't quote a scripture. There's something wrong with that. When you can talk about somebody all day long, but you can't pray for them. There's something wrong with that. Have you heard the term, I'm a spiritual person? Have you ever heard somebody say that? I'm a spiritual person. Have you ever wondered what do they mean by that? When they say, I'm a spiritual person. Well, the definition of being a spiritual person is somebody who is connected with something larger than themselves, it could be a spirit, it could be another person, it could be an individual, but they never call him God. All they know and all they will be willing to admit is that it's something bigger than themselves. And this something, this higher power that's bigger than me can do things that I can't do, but they won't name him God. God is tired of that. He wants to be recognized. He wants to be acknowledged. When God was speaking to me, it made me weep because he said, I I rescue the same people who ignore me. I rescue, I restore the same people that ignore me. I stand at the door and knock, and they won't let me in, but yet they call on me when things don't go their way. He said, I'm tired of that. He wants us to understand. He wants us to understand that time is running out. We don't have the kind of time that we think we have. The rest of this day is not even promised to us. Do you have, do you have it all together? Is your spirit right with God? Is it? Because he's tired. He's tired of the excuses. He's tired of being your mistress because we treat him like a mistress. He's tired of that. And he's given us an opportunity to do something about that. God is asking No, he didn't ask. He said, where is my reverence? When is the last time you cried out for me? When is the last time you cried because you couldn't spend time with me? When is the last time you made time for me? When is the last time that you put me above everybody else? When is the last time? When is the last time? He 
said, I shouldn't be in a rotation. I should always be first. I should always be first. I should always be first. Lamentations 3.40 says, let us examine and probe our ways and let us return to the Lord. What are you going to do with that? What are you going to do with that challenge? What are you going to do with that? Are we going to make excuses again as to why he can't be first? Are we going to turn to somebody else other than him once again? Remember, God has no competition. But yet, he has to compete for our time. We'll go from store to store trying to find an item, but we don't have time to read. We don't have time to pray. We can't pray for ourselves. We can't pray for anybody else. God is tired. He's tired. How will you respond to that? Zechariah 1 and 3 says, Therefore, say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Return to me, that I may return to you. Some of us are separated from God and we don't even know it. Do you understand what a scary place that is to be in? You don't even know God is gone. You don't even know you've moved. That's a dangerous place to be in, in this day and time. To understand that God is no longer with you. What will you do with that? What will you do with that? I'm grateful that God gave me the opportunity because, you know, the truth of the matter is there are some things that we cannot learn until we experience some pain. There are some things we won't learn until we lose something. There are some things that won't be perfected until we lose something or someone. What I'm grateful for is that the people that I have lost knew the Lord. And whether you realize that or not, that's a huge comfort. That's a huge comfort. But what will you do with that? I know it would be easy to ignore this message it would be easy to ignore God asking you to return to him. It would be easy just to go back to your ordinary life. But what if tonight was it? Yeah. Pastor always is always talking about that hyphen. What if your hyphen ended tonight? Are you ready? Do you know where you'd be going? Are you sure? This is not like wishing up on a star. This is not like crossing your fingers. Because eternity is permanent. That's right. 
Do you know where you would be spending eternity? Is your relationship right with God? Is it? Because the truth of the matter is, there's not one person in here that couldn't stand to be closer to God. What will you do with that? What will you do with that? I have been in so many situations that I have placed myself in, but because of the grace of God, I'm allowed to stand here and tell you about it. I'm grateful. I should have been in jail. I should have been. I should have been. But God. But God. You all don't know my story. You don't know what I had to get to, what I had to go through to be standing up here. You all don't know. Now, I may look like Polly Shortbread, but I'm not. (laughs) I'm really not. But I thank God that he didn't allow everything that I touched to touch me back and take me out. I'm grateful. I am so grateful. I am so very grateful. It doesn't mean that I didn't learn some lessons because they come. When you venture outside the will of God, the lessons are gonna come. But I'm grateful. I'm grateful. I'm so grateful. I'm grateful that I got a do-over. Everybody doesn't get that. I remember two years ago, on our fast, I ended up in the ER and I actually felt like, I actually felt like I was dying. And my friend, Francetta, Pastor Francetta, I called her to take me. We got there and discovered that my Blood pressure was extremely low. It was 80 over 60. And because I take blood pressure medicine, had I taken it, I might not be standing here. Had I taken it, had I taken it. But because I had had a conversation earlier that day with my daughter, who's a nurse, just a casual conversation, I remember something that she said. As sick as I was, I remembered something that she said. It wasn't my time. It wasn't my time. She told me, she said, when you lay around, it lowers your blood pressure. So had I taken my medication when I was already 80 over 60, I may not be standing here. See, that may be a small thing to you, but that's life to me. That's life to me. 
and I refused to believe that God spared me so I could treat him like a mistress. I refuse to believe that. I refuse to believe that. God has been way too good to me for me not to give him what he deserves. We owe God everything. We owe him everything. Every breath, every blink, every sound, every step, every movement, we owe him everything. Everything. And when he asked, when he asked that he be put first, when he asked, where is his reverence? We have an obligation to answer and to act. We have an obligation. It's not an option. I understand that Kobe Bryant was at church. Either the morning of or the day before, he got on a helicopter. We don't know the conversation. He didn't know that was it. He didn't know that that would be his last time. None of those nine people did. They had made plans for the entire day. They had made plans to return to their families. What have you made plans for? that you really believe are gonna come true. Because you're assuming that you have that kind of time. God is tired. He said, return to him and he'll return to us. What are you gonna do about it? What are you going to do with it? This is a simple message. But for whatever reason, God gave it to me. There's somebody in here that needs to hear it. And there's somebody in here that needs to be provoked to putting God first, to returning to him, to putting God in his rightful place to giving him the reverence that he deserves, that he has earned, to stop taking him for granted. To pick up your word, to spend time with him in prayer. These are not options. We all have choices. We all have choices. And if you think that you and God are okay like that, then I'm not talking to you. But I'm going to take this message and I'm going to let it apply to me And I'm going to get on my face before God. And I'm going to close up some gaps. Everybody in here? Anybody in here got gaps? But God, anybody. Anybody. Well, you're going to have an opportunity to close those gaps. And that's grace. That God would even give us that opportunity to do that because Chances are it's not the first, second, third, fourth, or fifth time that he's communicated this very same message to each and every one of us. So what will you do with it? 
what are you going to do with it? Will it be something else that you ignore? Or are you going to give God what he's asking for? What are you going to do? And please, don't take lightly because I'm soft-spoken. Because I'm not in your face. Because if God would have wanted that, then he would have given that to somebody who did that. But when you speak softly, Usually it means I have to crouch closer to here, which brings me closer to him. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Everybody has a choice. Everybody has a decision to make. And nobody is exempt. Exempt. 